Hello, everyone. There's a lot of craziness going on outside right now, isn't there? In, in the world, in our country, maybe in your country. And it's so easy for us to get sidetracked from uh, focusing on the things above, as Paul tells us in Colossians 3. Do you sometimes feel, with all this going on, who are you? Do you even matter? Are you significant or insignificant? Are you really a nobody? Well, don't believe it, because Actually, indeed, as I've been doing in this series, I'm trying to focus our attention on things above. And uh, God has called the world's nobodies to shame those who are really the somebodies of the world and to glorify his name that he can use someone like you, like me, with all of our weaknesses and problems. We're not the great of the world, 1 Corinthians 1, but God has called us to shame the wise, to shame the great, and to give glory to him that he can do what he's doing even for people like in, in people like you and me. Now God has called you to be among the called and chosen, and I hope you will be among the faithful, to be among the very first in the at the in, that you'll be in the very first resurrection, and that perhaps you'll even be part of the bride. But certainly, hopefully, you and I will be at least at the wedding, maybe part of the bride, maybe part of the guests, as I talked about last time. This is part three to a series. So can you imagine what a wedding uh, would be like that God himself put on? So we're going to talk about that today. Part one was about where it is. It's up there in heaven. Uh, part two, and I showed you that very clearly, I hope. Part two is who's going to be there, in what capacity, at least some speculation, if not downright verses on it, but some, some speculation perhaps. And then part three today is about when all of this takes place. So welcome everyone. Welcome all of you from around the world. I'm glad you're here at our free website, lightontherock.org. I'm Philip Shields. I'm your host and the founder of Light on the Rock. So let's get started. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. So we have to love him for us to be among those who are there. And then verse 10 says, but God has begun to reveal it to us at least by his Holy Spirit. Satan's trying to distract you with all this craziness, trying to get you polarized, trying to get me polarized, right versus left, liberal versus conservative, and all of that, even racially divided. It should not be. It should not be. Let's keep our minds on the things God has called us to. And you know what? You're not at all insignificant to Yeshua. Uh, he is looking at you and he's excited about what, what's happening in, inside of you. He's working inside of you. He's going to finish. Philippians 1, 6 and 11 says he's going to finish what he started in you. And uh, the, will be covered by the righteousness of Christ. Uh, his works, his righteousness will be what God sees. Philippians 1, 11. So if you're part of the bride, God the Son, the Son of God, actually sees you, calls you, thinks of you as his beloved, as his beloved, just as you think of him, I hope, as your beloved master, your beloved king, your beloved savior. So even as we call him that, he knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. He's really getting excited about this wedding coming up. I'm sure he is. So the last trumpet will sound. And I believe the Bible calls it the seventh trump. The Bible nowhere talks about the eighth trump or the ninth trump. So the seventh trump seems to be, the seventh trump of the seventh seal seems to be the last trump. And the dead in Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 53, and 1 Thessalonians 4, the dead in Christ will rise first. We covered that last time. And then those of us who remain, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17, those of us who remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 says, uh, if you read all the way from before that even, it says that we're going to have a various levels of glory, and we're going to be changed to spirit beings. We're going to be incorruptible. I covered the verses last time. We read them last time. So make sure, if you haven't heard parts 1 and 2, that you please do that. Please listen to parts one and two. It will uh, help you understand this one a whole lot better, though I'll refer to things, uh, but I won't be turning to as many scriptures that we've already covered. Maybe one or two, but not as many. 
we're going to have a lot more to cover today. Now, from this point on, words, I want to say this, though. I haven't had an angel tell me a date or give me some special revelation, whispered in my ear, taking me on a long walk. Probably most of you haven't either. So when it comes time to prophetic announcements, I have my advice to all of us who speak, ride loosely in the prophetic saddle. Ride loosely in the saddle. Unless something is dogmatically stated in Scripture, let's not be dogmatic where Scripture isn't. But for example, we know, to me it's fairly clear to me, that the wedding is going to be in heaven, put on by God the Father. There are just too many verses that tell us that. Now, who exactly the bride will be? We know that the church is being groomed to be the bride of Christ. Um, but there are also guests who are there. Uh, the king came in to see the wedding guests, Matthew 22. And uh, so the guests are there. The wedding hall is filled with guests and so on. So who are the wedding guests? We have to ride a little loosely in the saddle here. because, and, uh, and is everyone either a bride or a guest? Or are there some who are, for example, if I get married, sure, there's a special relationship with my wife. But if I'm the president of a country, I also have various secretaries, a secretary of state, secretary of defense. I have different people in different capacities, director of intelligence and security and so on. And perhaps in, in, perhaps in the kingdom of God, there's the bride, but maybe some who aren't even necessarily part of the bride will have very, very high offices and positions. I'm just saying don't get yourself locked in to thinking it's got to be this way or got to be that way because I heard a sermon on that a few years ago. Unless God's spoken to you specifically, I hate to try to say what God is going to do. His thinking is so much beyond mine and yours. Anyway, I believe the bride, the guest, and perhaps others who are in heaven before the throne attending the wedding are all first fruits. Are all first fruits, redeemed from the earth, all of them. And they're all in the first resurrection. Or else how could they be up there in heaven, right? How could the guests be up there in heaven if they're not in the first resurrection? They're all in shining bright garments. Even the great innumerable multitude, it says in Revelation 7, have washed their robes, their, their garments in the blood of Christ. And they're standing before him and he will shepherd them and dwell among them. That sounds like they're part of his flock. Okay, so the great multitude from all nations and tribes and languages and everything are all there too. So, um, so anyway, not everyone though is going to be, in, uh, not everyone in the wedding is part of the bride. Every wedding I've been to, the bride and groom are always the minority. They're not the majority, that's for sure. So anyway, let's read that again. Revelation 20, verse 6. And also Revelation 19. Before we go to there, Revelation 19 verse, I think it's verse 8 or 9. It says, blessed are those invited or called to the wedding. And then the next chapter, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. The first resurrection. Hebrews 11 calls it the better resurrection. We'll read that in a minute. Over such, back in Revelation 20 verse 6, over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hebrews 11, verse 35. Remember in the first resurrection, why is it better? Because it's first, first of all, and, and that gives us a head start of a thousand years, or at least a lot of years. The rest of the dead, you know, uh, there's some controversy anyway, but but the rest of the dead happen long after we're resurrected. And so Hebrews 11, verse 35, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So it's better because uh, it said, what we read in Revelation 20, we'll be priests of God. Uh, I think it's 1 Peter 2, verse 9, we shall be a royal priesthood. And uh, it's better for a lot of reasons. Some of us will be part of the bride of Christ. I think that makes it better too. Uh, those who are part of the bride of Christ or those who are part of the wedding. In Hebrews 11, verse 39 to 40, And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through their faith, 
did not receive the promise. Not yet. Did not receive it. God having provided something better, there's that word again, for us, that those who died ahead of before us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So part of what makes it a better resurrection is we're changed to spirit, we're changed to immortal, we're also made perfect, finally made perfect at that point. Anyway, so that's, a, that's all exactly what uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 says again, that we're raised first, with the, I mean, the dead are raised first, and then we meet them in the air. And then what happens? And then what happens? Remember, there are sequences given to us in the book of Revelation. Revelation tosses in some inset chapters once in a while. There are seven seals that have to be opened up first. Most of those are in Revelation 6. Seven seals. And in the seven seals, seal number five is the Great Tribulation. Seal number six are the cosmic signs and incredible things in the sky and in, in the, uh, what we see in the sky. And so anyway, seven seals are open, and first six are mentioned in Revelation 6. And then in Revelation 7, there's a hiatus. There's a slowing down. The 144,000 are promised protection. They are sealed. Uh, but the dead in Christ don't need protection. So it's not those who have died in the Lord you know, who are part of the 144,000. Those are those who've come through the Great Tribulation alive. They have, they have uh, come through alive, the, the, the signs, the heavenly signs. And God says, okay, enough. I want them protected. I want them sealed. And so on. That's all in Revelation 7. And then the seventh seal starts in Revelation 8. A seal, like opening the seals of a scroll, okay? And the seventh seal has seven trumpet plagues and events. Revelation 8 and 9, if you want to take the time to read through those. And then the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet is composed of seven last bowl, B-O-W-L, plagues. And that starts in Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19, talking about the seventh trumpet sounding. And then the seven bowl plagues are listed in Revelation 15 and 16. So just before Christ returns to collect his bride, something else is going on. Of course, the Great Tribulation has been going on. But during that great tribulation, there are two witnesses, whoever they will be or whatever they will be. I am not going to speculate. Many are speculating. I will not. They have not yet been revealed to us. They preach for three and a half years, overlapping much of that time of the great tribulation. God allows them to be martyred. And let's read it. Revelation 11, verses 3 to 13. I'll read the highlights as we post it up here. Revelation 11, verse 3, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So for three and a half years, or 42 months, they're there in Jerusalem preaching. Verse 4, they're the two olive trees that are mentioned in the Old Testament. Verse 5, if anyone wants to harm them, they're, they're, they die. Okay, uh, they're die, They die by fire coming out of the mouth of these two witnesses, it says. Verse 6, I'm, I'm rushing because I have a lot to cover today. They have power to shut heaven. So there's drought. Uh, they have power to turn waters into blood, verse 6, and uh, to uh, cause as many plagues as they wish. Verse 7, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, this is that political, economic, military system that will rule much of the world, ascends out of the bottomless pit and will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. So they die. Their dead bodies lie in the streets where our Lord was crucified. It's called Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Egypt. Clearly that's Jerusalem where it says where our Lord was crucified. And then those from the peoples, the tribes, the tongues, and nations. This is a prophecy, by the way, of internet, of satellites, of all of that stuff will see their dead bodies for three and a half days. They won't allow them to be buried. And they'll all be making merry. The whole world will be so glad to finally get rid of these two prophets who tormented them with plagues and all that. Now, verse 11. After the three and a half days, the breath of life, uh, the breath of life from God entered them, 
and they stood on their feet. Imagine the hair in the back of your neck standing up watching this, I'm sure. And so, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And, and then they heard a loud voice from heaven. They heard it. They heard the loud voice. I think it's very possible people will hear these trumpets. Certainly they did at Mount Sinai when the shofar, the trumpet of God, blasted. It was so loud they, they thought their ears were going to split open. And so, or, you know, they'd go deaf from it being so loud. They heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies saw them. So imagine that. The two witnesses are killed. This is before the seventh trumpet. They're resurrected, and they're raised up to heaven before the seventh trumpet. Maybe God's giving them some extra glory here or honor. Now Revelation 11, verse 15. We've just read verse 11. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And you could also read what the 24 elders say in Revelation 11, verses 16 to 18. Let's pick up in verse 19. So now the resurrection has taken place. That's the last trump. It doesn't mention the resurrection here. But to me, when you combine all the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, as well as 11, 11, 15 of Revelation, that's most likely when the first resurrection takes place. Because then, verse 19, the temple of God was opened in heaven. Why would it be opened? Maybe God's bringing in his bride and the guests. Remember one of the parables of Jesus, the ten virgins. Uh, half of them didn't have enough oil. And the doors were open for the five who got there on time and it was shut for those who came in late. The temple of God was open in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple. Revelation eleven nineteen. There were lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. So I think that's possibly why the temple is open, was to bring in the bride and the guests and others who will be there. When does all this happen? That's my topic today is when. So I believe the bride and guests who are in heaven in front of the throne are all first fruits, redeemed from the earth. They're all there. And they're all in the first resurrection, whether they're part of the bride or the guests. And what holy day pictures these first fruits? It's Feast of Pentecost, Feast of First Fruits. It's the Feast of Weeks. So when the two leavened loaves that we read about last time and on the day of Pentecost, there are two leavened loaves on the day of Pentecost that are raised up to heaven or raised up towards heaven by the high priest and then brought back down again. Remember both parts of that. Raised up and brought back down again. That has very deep meaning. All that happened on Pentecost. God always does things exactly on the day that that day pictured. So on Passover day, when all the little lambs were being killed, which all pictured Jesus or Yeshua, Guess when Yeshua, the Son of God, was killed? On Passover day, at the time when most of the Passover lambs were beginning to be killed in Jerusalem. And so we also know uh, on Passover is when you and I recommitted to our master and we drank from his cup. And we symbolize that every year with Passover. We drink of his cup saying, I'm willing to go through whatever that cup means, whatever it has in store, whatever you have in store for me. And we ate of his bread, we drank of his cup, and we washed each other's feet as a symbol of what's going to happen in the new kingdom coming to earth. There's already the kingdom of God in heaven, but it's coming down to rule here on earth. We drank with him, we ate with him. And then on wave sheaf day, when Christ went to heaven to be accepted on our behalf for the rest of the harvest, what a, you know, that was the barley harvest, what a glorious reunion that must have been for the Father and Son, God the Father and God the Son, to be together again with billions of angels, hundreds of millions at least, cheering and praising and worshiping, singing and what a grand time it must have been. What an emotional time it must have been. 
But that happened exactly on wave sheath day as they were raising the, the flower of the barley up, the omer of barley. And then on Pentecost day, they had these two big loaves. They were big loaves, by the way, of leavened bread that were raised up. It was also on Pentecost day when God married Israel at Mount Sinai. It was on Pentecost day when Mount Sinai was all ablaze with the glory of God. And Moses was called to come up to the top of that mountain. And I feel, this is picturing the time when the wedding will take place, the, fe the feast of first fruits, the two leavened first fruits loaves, and all of the things we talked about in part two, and even part one. So it pictures the church ascending to heaven for the wedding, pictured by the two leavened loaves. So yes, I believe in a coming year on Pentecost, I believe the wedding will take place in heaven, and I don't know the year, and shame on you guys who are out there putting years and dates, and you're always failing so far. Uh, I get notices of this from time to time. Don't do it unless an angel truly has revealed, appeared before you and told you. Neither do I know the day, the year, nor the hour. I don't even know the year yet. We're all tempted to say it can happen any time now. There's still many things that have to happen. Maybe I'll give a sermon on what Scripture does say has to happen before Christ will be back here. So whether God comes for us earlier than Pentecost or right on Pentecost, it's up to him. But I'm confident the wedding itself will be on Pentecost, up there in heaven. Pentecost is all about the first fruits, remember, of wheat, those being called now. James 1.18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Also, Romans 8.23, we have the firstfruits of the Holy Spirit. The fall holy days, on the other hand, are all about God going out to save the rest of mankind, the rest of humanity. So, so that's Revelation 11, verse 15 and 19, the seven trumpet sounds. And then we have Revelation 12 and 13, our inset chapters about other things. We come back to Revelation 14 and we see the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation 7 on the earth being protected. Now we see them up in heaven on the sea of glass. We see them called first fruits. We see them following the lamb wherever he goes. Many have assumed that's the bride. It might be. Hallelujah. Praise God if it is. If they are. And if they are, if the 144,000 is the bride, then I'd sure like to be part of it. It nowhere is called the bride. I think we're all assuming that because they follow the lamb wherever he goes, that that must be the bride. But I believe they're more like special attendants to the Son of God, the 144,000 of Revelation 14. I believe the bride of Christ is pictured by the Proverbs 31 wife, it's called in our English Bibles, the virtuous woman. It actually means women of valor, woman of courage, woman of strength. The Bible speaks a lot of a lot of powerful men, and the Hebrew word's the same, men of valor. Okay? But when the translators wanted to talk about this bride, they didn't want to talk about a, a woman of valor, strong and powerful. They wanted to talk about a virtuous wife. So they changed the word to virtuous. It means valor. Check it out. But anyway, this woman of valor, is hardly following her husband everywhere he goes. Go back and check it out. Read Proverbs 31, verses 11 to 31. This woman of valor is very talented, very capable. And God trusts her. Her husband trusts her. What's she doing? It says she's going to the merchant ships, buying food for the family. She goes out to check out the land and buys some land, eventually plant a vineyard there. She's making clothing for children. She's helping out the poor and the needy. She's considered wise woman. She's busy. She's strong. She's staying up late at night. She's helping the poor. And she's considered highly by everybody in the community. You see what I'm saying? That more describes, I think, the bride of Christ. And some will say that 144,000 is the total number of the bride, is the total number of the first resurrection. I personally don't see it. I personally don't buy that. I think... Uh, Certainly the great multitude you couldn't even number in Revelation 7. They're certainly in the first resurrection because they're pictured in front of the throne of God. 
God is said to be their shepherd. The Lord is their shepherd. And he will dwell among them. I mean, that, those people surely are in the first resurrection as well. You see what I'm saying? Um, and the 144,000 certainly are. So, so these people are shown as having washed their robes, in the, the great multitude, in the blood. They're serving Christ day and night. So Christ comes after the great tribulation. Let's read that in Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31. All of you who've been waiting. I've had three people tell me this, this week alone. Surely the rapture is going to come soon. Folks, God will protect his flock whom he wants to protect. And God will let some of his flock, many of his flock, to be honest with you, be beheaded, be tortured, be tested and tried. Many of them will be part of the Laodicean attitude. I wish that you will buy for me gold tried in the fire. Repent, and I will come and eat. You'll come and eat with me, and I with you. You know, Revelation 3, the end of it. But Matthew 24, the seventh seal has seven trumpets. So the last trumpet seems to be the last trumpet. Let's read it. Matthew 24, 39, 29 to 31. Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. After, that's seal number five of Revelation 6. The sun will be dark and the moon not give its light. No, that's the heavenly signs of Revelation 6. Seal number six. Verse 30, then the sign of Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming not on white chargers, but on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. I'm sure we will all hear it. I'm pretty sure of that. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other, from all directions. After the great tribulation, after the heavenly signs, Christ returns, collects his bride, the elect. The word elect there from the Greek is eklektos. It means picked out by God, picked out, chosen. So remember that we're told that we're resurrected and changed the spirit of the last trump. So that's what it's talking about that. But now what? So we're gathered by the angels. We meet in Christ, we're meeting Christ in the air. Now what? Again, like I covered in the other, other sermons, we, we go to heaven to get married. But after that seventh trump, this is very important. After the seventh trump sounds, Revelation 15 and 16 says there are seven final plagues, the seven last plagues, as we call them, and after the seventh trumpet sounds. And so, um, so we're in heaven and not on earth, getting married while the final seven plagues are being unleashed on the earth. And that all will take time. So when do we rise and go to heaven to meet our father? At the seventh trump. And where is he? He's in heavenly Jerusalem. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That should get our minds off the craziness going on right now. We should, we should be really, really excited about this. Then the Pentecost harvest, remember, it's called the Feast of First Fruits. And that's when Israel married God. So when will all this happen? I am satisfied. If I'm proven wrong, or well, God says I'm wrong, fine. But I am satisfied that it does not make sense for the first fruits to be resurrected and marrying sometime in the fall, which pictures God working with the rest of humanity. Our, our time is the Feast of First Fruits. That's our feast. That's our focus. That's the time of the first fruits. Everything has its time and season, Ecclesiastes 3 says. So let's ask when the wedding will take place. What season is that? Again, if you go back to, Revel to Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23, talking about the seven holy days of God, the divine appointments, in verses 15 to 17, we're to count 50 from the day after the seventh Sabbath, not just seventh, you know, it's seventh Sabbath, the day after means a Sunday, in the day we, days we call that, and, and there shall be a grain offering. Leviticus 23, verse 17. Now you shall bring from your dwelling two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They will be fine flour. They'll be baked with leaven. They're the first fruits to Yehovah. Yeah, we are not sinless. 
We have had sin in our lives. So we are those leavened loaves. There are two of them because one pictures those who have died in Christ. That's, I believe, I'm convinced that's the, the way it is now. And then the second uh, wave loaf, I heard this from one minister in Washington State, and I believe that this is true. And the other wave loaf is for those, who, those of us who are alive and remain, shall be caught up with them. So two leavened loaves of wheat are raised up by the priest and lowered back on Pentecost. So when is all this going to happen? I believe on Pentecost. That's what it all pictures. That's about the time Ruth and Boaz would have got married. That's the time when God married Israel. And that's, you know, it's just, it just makes sense. But what about the Feast of Trumpets, you might say? What about that? Surely the Feast of Trumpets bears in this. Well, remember, we think of Feast of Trumpets, we think of the last trumpet. Therefore, Christ must surely come. The seventh trumpet surely must be the Feast of Trumpets. But go back to Numbers 10, verse 10. Let's post that. Numbers 10, verse 10. It says, In the day of your gladness, in your appointed feast, and at the beginnings of your months, you shall blow the trumpets. So actually we find that the silver trumpets that were made, Numbers 10, verses 1 and 2, they, they used the trumpets for many things, to call the people together, to start marching out, to, the cloud was moving, time to move, things like that. But also it says, on your appointed feasts. And so the trumpets were blown actually on all of the holy days, not just Feast of Trumpets, not just on Rosh Hashanah. So the trumpets are sounded on the day of Pentecost, and even at Mount Sinai, remember, they heard that loud trumpet blast, the shofar, and on Pentecost when God married Israel. So after the resurrection, there are still seven last plagues. That all takes time. We're up there in heaven. We're not just hovering over Jerusalem for months. No, we go to heavenly Jerusalem to get married. As I showed you last time when Isaac took Rebecca into his mother's tent, Galatians says that picture going, that pictured heavenly Jerusalem. The seven last plagues, if you read them in Revelation 15 and 16, you can see how that could easily take three months. The time we're spending in heaven will be heaven time. Heaven is outside of time and space as far as I understand it. I don't fully understand that, but I keep hearing that. God is outside of time and space. Makes sense to me. A day with us is like a thousand years with him and vice versa. So three months here on earth could seem like a really forever kind of time up there with God, taking our time more or less, introducing God introducing us to our teammates who we're going to work with, showing us the house he's made for us, for you to live in, showing you your responsibilities, showing you your way around, around this town. This town, <laughs> heavenly Jerusalem, if it were on the earth right now, would cover one half of the United States. One half. 1,500 miles. You know, Long and wide, 1,500 miles high. Hey, our mountains are seven, I think about six and a half, seven miles high. I mean, so this is really, really, really a high, high city. Big city. Revelation 16, verses 12 to 16. There it talks about the sixth angel. Let's put it on the board while I'm just talking about it. You read it yourself. A sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Waters dried up, making way for the kings of the east to, that they might be prepared to walk on through. Okay. And then uh, three unclean spirits like frogs. I'm convinced that angels, good and bad angels, look like things we, for the most part, look like things that we identify with. Horses, eagles, frogs, and so on. Um, in this case, it's demons, unclean spirits, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. These are spirits of demons, verse 14, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth. So there, these, these uh, false prophets and beast power, they have power, supernatural power, demonic power to do miracles that you know couldn't be just human, uh, human ability. Remember this someday. It might be in our lifetime. It might be in the, in, within a decade. Who knows? We might be watching some of this. We need to be aware of it. 
So anyway, um, these demons go out. We're actually up in heaven at this point at the wedding, but I'm saying that anyone left on earth should hopefully know that these are not uh, just tricks. They're de demonically inspired. To gather them, the end of verse 14, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And behold, I'm coming as a thief. Watch your clothing so you don't walk naked. Verse 16, they're going to gather them to that place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Har Megiddo. I've been to Megiddo. It's a big, big, wide valley up in the north of Israel. They gathered them there for Armageddon. So the first time Christ returns, we read it already, he comes in the clouds, he collects his bride, he goes back to heaven. He's seen by the whole world. So now the world knows there's an invasion from outer space. The ones who know their Bible will know that probably was Jesus Christ. But the rest of the world, much of the world, is demonically inspired and they are children of, of, of Satan. The Bible said that, Jesus said that. Uh, you are not of my, my father is not your father. You're of your father, the devil, John 8. John 8 says that, around verse 44. It's not in my notes, so you can find it in John 8. And then after the wedding, Christ and his armies, including his bride, return on spirit white chargers, probably angelic beings, to face the world's armies along with the hosts of God. He's the Lord of hosts, millions of angels, and also his bride. Some are out there teaching that God's returning to fight the armies only with the angels, not with the church. That's simply not true. Revelation 17, 14 says, it's posted up there, Revelation 17, 14, these will make war with the Lamb, the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called, that's us, chosen and faithful. Those with him. And the context is coming to fight the assembled armies. And those with him, Matthew 25, 31, includes obviously the angels. It says so, Matthew 25, 31. But Revelation 17, 14 says, besides the angels, this time he's returning with his bride on white spirit steeds, coming to fight and put down this rebellion against him. So that second return, the first return, he comes in the clouds, gathers his elect, goes back up to heaven, get married, and after it's time to come back, they, we all get on white superchargers, uh, angelic beings, and we come back with him to face the armies at the Mount of Olives and beyond, as Zechariah 14 says. So anyway, the fall holy days, remember, are all about, the, about God saving the rest of the world. It's not really about us. And Matthew 22 says a certain king uh, a certain king decided to put on a wedding for his son. We know that king has to be God. And it says the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 22, verse 2, is like a certain king who arranged a wedding for his son. The son has to be Christ. And then they go out and they find guests to fill the hall. And the king, verse 11, came in to see the guests. The king is in heaven. And Hebrews 12 tells us all this happens in heaven. Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. But you've come to Mount Zion. You haven't come to some earthly Mount Zion or Mount Sinai or anything else. You've come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly, the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, church of the firstborn, Church of the firstborn. The firstborn is Christ. We're part of his church, his group. But we also are firstborn ones with him, after him, who are registered. We're first fruits, okay? Who are registered in heaven to God, judge of all. That's where we're coming to. And the spirits of just men made perfect. Made perfect. I can hardly wait because I'm anything but perfect right now. And remember also that Yeshua said, I go prepare a place for you. Remember that? That's our city. That is our city. Hebrews 11, verse 9 and 10, it says right there that Abraham waited, in verse 10, for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the city he looked forward to. He's part of that. That's his city. 
That's our city. It's called the bride in Revelation. Is it 21? I think it is. Anyway, Hebrews 11, verse 16. Now they desire a better, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. Doesn't that sound just like what Yeshua said in John 14, verses 2 and 3? Or 1 and 3? I go prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. And in my Father's home are many houses, many places to live. That's why I say he's building all that, getting all that ready for us. It's going to be spectacular. You don't want to miss that. You don't want to get sidetracked with anything else. I can get sidetracked. You can get sidetracked. So I'm giving this sermon. I'm preaching to myself as much as anyone. Get back to this stuff. Set your mind on things above. Because again, 1 Corinthians 2 verses, verse 9 says, No one's seen. We can't imagine. It hasn't entered our heart of man. The things God has prepared for them. Those who love him. And then in Revelation 3, I just want you to know, this is going to be our city. We get married there and we're part of it. Revelation 3 verse 12, He overcomes, said to the Philadelphian church, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out. I will write on him the name of my God. Yeshua has a God. He is God also, but he has a God, God the Father, God Most High. We get the name of God Most High and the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. Again, where are we going? We're going to the city of God, heavenly Jerusalem. It says right here, it's the New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, Revelation 21. After a thousand years is over is when all that happens. So this is why Paul says we're ambassadors for God, citizens of that city. We're citizens of heavenly, we're dual citizens. Paul talked openly about himself being a Roman citizen, but he also says my citizenship is in heaven. And uh, we are ambassadors, therefore, because we're from that city, from that country. But remember again, when Isaac had Rebekah brought to him, and he was at his father's house, his father where Abraham was, he loved Rebekah, it says, and I think it's Genesis 24, and he took her into his mother Sarah's tent. Genesis 24, I think it's the very last verse, around verse 67. Galatians 4, which I think I read last time, says very clearly that Sarah pictures, let's post that up there, Galatians 4, verses 23 to 27, and notice that Sarah pictures the new covenant from Jerusalem above the end of what's posted up there. And so when he took Rebekah into his mother's tent, that was prophesying and revealing to us that Christ, who was, who was pictured by Isaac, will take his bride, which is the church, into his mother's tent, which is Jerusalem above. All of those things and all the other verses I've shown you. Jerusalem above, therefore, becomes the mother of us all. We're considered born in heavenly Jerusalem. Psalm 87, verses 4 to 6. Some say the church is the mother of us all. It's actually the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, in fact, we, we, let's put that back on the board. Galatians 4, verse 26 here. But Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Jerusalem above is our mother. And mothers give birth. And when we are changed to spirit, our city, our birthright, becomes the new Jerusalem. Psalm 87, verses 4 to 6. I'll make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. Okay, that one's born in Ethiopia, that one's born in this place. And of Zion, it will be said, Psalm 87, 5, this one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself shall establish her. Yehovah, the Lord, will record when he registers his people. Remember it says in Hebrews 11 that those who are registered in heaven, the elect are registered in heaven. When he registers the people, this one was born there. There? What? In Mount Zion, heavenly Mount Zion. So that's our city. So anyway, upon arriving at the groom's house, the bride, the groom, will go into a hoopah 
and uh, the bridal chamber where they will consummate their marriage and festivities could last seven days or more. And there could be no finer wedding that I can imagine, envision, than the wedding of Jesus Christ. I would like you, by the way, to hear a sermon. I posted it in audio, in the audio portion. Maybe we can show that on the screen where that is. The audio portion. Uh, there's the video portion, there's the audio portion, then there's blogs. I think that's the sequence. But Jeff Nickham's sermon, Jeff Nickham's a friend of mine, a minister, and he gave a very fine sermon called The, the Big Picture, talking about being spirit and how God's heavenly... Anyway, I don't want to give it away. You guys hear it. Uh, the size, the glory of heavenly Jerusalem. That's our city. Um, so I've reposted Big, big Picture to the uh, website, and I'll put the notes also in, or the link also in the notes here. Now, I just can't imagine a city 1,500 miles high. How high do the satellites fly? It's not even that high, is it? Isn't it like 200, 300 miles high? Anyway, our highest mountains are seven or seven and a half miles high. Can you imagine a city, a spirit city? What is that in kilometers? Maybe 10 kilometers? I don't know. A spirit city where the spirit streets are spirit gold, gates made of solid pearl, powerful angelic beings coming and going. Can you imagine it? Anything you've seen in science fiction will, will seem paltry, uh, like nothing, when we actually see the city. And that's where we're going to go get married. And we're going to be given beautiful garments. It was granted to them to be arrayed in linen, okay, clean and bright, clean and white or bright, uh, which represents the righteousness of the saints. And my righteousness, by the way, is not my own good doing. My righteousness, Philippians 1.11, makes it very clear that the righteousness we have is righteousness by faith. It's Christ's righteousness in us. So when Christ is living the way he should be living in me or in you, he will live in me the way he lived before, righteously. There will be righteous works. There will be obedience. But it's Christ's perfection. It's Christ's righteousness. And my faith must be in him, not in my own ability to do good enough works to be saved. It's my faith in him. We'll talk more about that maybe in a coming sermon. Again, whose righteousness are you seeking? I might redo something like that again. I've given many sermons on that. I think at the wedding, we'll be able to immediately know and recognize at least the ones who are the great ones, the, the great ones, I mean the, the leaders, the great forefathers, the great leading women of the Bible. I think we will recognize that must be Abraham, and that must be Moses over there, and over there is Sarah. Look, there's Abraham, there's Sarah, Isaac, and there's Jacob. I think we'll recognize the leaders. There's Peter, there's John, there's James. Why do I say that? Because at the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John were able to see a vision that had, Christ says, don't tell the vision to anybody. And Christ was bright as can be in this vision. He was transfigured. And they immediately knew that the two that were with him that he was talking to were Moses and Elijah. I don't know if we'll recognize or know people we've never met in our life before otherwise, the rest of us. But I'm pretty sure we're going to know, hey, there's Moses, there's Elijah. And uh, there's Ruth, there's Esther over there. So anyway, yes, we'll be in heaven for the wedding. Let's be glad and rejoice. Revelation 19.7, let's put that up. And give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and you're there. And his wife has made herself ready. And in verse 9, blessed are those invited, called to the wedding. So the wedding's completed. Now what happens? Let's wrap it up now. Heaven is once again opened. The temple is. And we come back to earth with our husbands. Revelation 17, 14. Those who are with him to fight the armies are those who are the called, the chosen, and have re remained faithful to the end, and the faithful, just like the, just like the Marine, the Semper Fi, Semper Fidelis, um, always faithful, okay? We're called, we're chosen by God, 
when we show that we honor that calling, respect it, try to live a life worthy of that calling, maybe that's worth a sermon soon too. So anyway, the wedding, the heavens opened again. Uh, Revelation 19, verses 11 to 14. I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His head were, on his hand, head were many crowns, symbolizing that he's going to be king of kings. He had a name written on him no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 1 and 2, and then verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. John 1, 14. This is Yeshua coming back. This is not God the Father yet. This is Jesus Christ, Yeshua. And the armies in heaven, that's the angels. But Revelation 17, 14 indicates we also will be with him. As I said, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, who are the armies who accompany him? No doubt. It's the, the angels, Matthew 25, 31, who comes with a host of angels, Matthew 25, 31. And the bride, Revelation 17, 14. Anyway, we defeat the armies gathered there. Zechariah 14 describes what a horrific scene it will be, in a way. But we're going to put down those who won't, uh, won't accept the rule of Christ. Those who want to live by anarchy, who want to live by their own rules. Oh no, you can't be that way. Can't be that way. And we reign with him a thousand years. We rebuild with him a worldwide-like Garden of Eden. And eventually there will be beautiful cities as well. It will be a gorgeous place, the whole world. I can't wait. So some future year from now, when I believe on Pentecost, you and I will be asked to sit at the wedding feast. There's even a verse, I meant to have it here, where it says Christ himself will get up and serve us. I'll try to put those, those in the notes. It's going to be beyond description, folks. In heavenly Jerusalem, maybe on the Sea of Glass, God the Father will be there. It says so in Matthew 22, the king came to see the guests. Let's become more zealous than ever before. Let's pray as never before. Let's seek God zealously as never before. Don't let yourself fall into lethargy like the latency in church. Just don't. Let's be considered worthy to be at that wedding. Pray always that you may be counted worthy. You know, I mean, I don't think that's just saying, as a friend was saying to me recently, that we're praying that we be worthy, that God will give us safety, although I pray for that too. But those who are praying constantly, God knows them. They're much more likely to be spared the things coming ahead. But no matter what happens, we're going to endure and be faithful to the very end. And we will be at that wonderful wedding. Oh, I can't wait to see you there and see my, my master. Our Father in heaven, great God in heaven, we bow our heads again to you and we just come before you now and help us get our minds on things above. Let's start looking up to you where you are, Father, up there. And Yeshua, please come and fill our hearts with your presence. Fill our hearts with your thoughts, your word. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let's humble ourselves like you humbled yourself. Let's serve one another. Let's seek you with our whole being. Seek the Father with our whole being. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Don't let us get down about what's happening around us here on earth. We know these things are foretold. You've got in the control. You, you're there. You're in charge. You're okay with this. Um, you're not okay with it in the sense that you agree with it, but you know things are going to get really bad. So help us trust you, live by faith, seek you, and look to the things above and look forward to being with you and being in the marriage of the Lamb. In Jesus' holy and righteous name, shine on us, protect us, watch over us, fill us with your spirit and wisdom, fill us with your love. Fill us, Father, and bring us into your presence. Thank you for this plan you have. Thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. Thank you.